This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon Cereal. If you're a regular watcher of this content, you'll know that there are very few things I love in the world quite as much as delicious cereal. I'm gonna finish my mouthful. But the problem is cereal is not always great for you. There were several years where I didn't eat cereal at all because as much as I love it, I was like, I don't need all that extra sugar in my life. It's not good for me. <laughs> anyway, along come Magic Spoon and they're like, oh, fact boy, I've got some news for you. We make cereal that is delicious and it also has no sugar lots of protein, and only three net grams of carbs per serving, it's only 110 calories. Cool, look, I mean, I don't know much about protein or carbs or sugar or that dietary stuff. I do know that protein is good, carbs and sugar, probably not so good. And uh, well, basically they were like zero sugar. I was like, okay, cool, sold. I wasn't eating it because of all the sugar and now I can eat it. And you also might be thinking, well, it's gonna taste absolutely terrible, Simon. It's got no sugar in it. Well, it doesn't, it tastes absolutely delicious. They sent me an insane amount of cereal to eat. Uh, I've got four of the flavors here, cinnamon, blueberry, fruity, and cocoa. I had peanut butter flavor, but I ate it all because it's so outrageously delicious. If you're ordering any, get the peanut butter one, just trust me, or just build yourself a multi-pack. It's also gluten-free, low-carb, GMO-free, all of that stuff as well. Anyway, what you should do, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash brain food to grab a variety pack and try it all out. Yeah, do the variety pack. I mean, that way you get to try it all. Look, peanut butter is the absolute <laughs> It's amazing. But get the variety pack, try it all out. Use my promo code brainfood to get $5 off. Magic Spoon also has a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, well, they'll give you your money back. Great, uh, let's get into the video. I'm gonna finish this and I'm gonna put these away. Ba -da 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 -da. Ba -da -da. Ba -da -da. It's a scenario we've all seen a hundred times. Our hero discovers a bomb planted by the villain, the countdown flashing in bright red numbers on the timer. Armed with only a pair of wire cutters, he opens the bomb and roots through the tangle of multicolored wires within, frantically searching for the right one to cut. Is it the red one or the blue one? Or maybe the yellow one? With his and dozens of other lives on the line, with shaking hands, he makes his choice as the timer ticks the last few seconds to zero. The so-called wire dilemma has been a staple of action movies for decades, but has this scenario ever actually played out in real life? And the short answer is yes, but as any bomb disposal technician will be quick to point out, only ever as a last resort, for there are much safer ways of disarming a bomb. The history of bomb disposal goes back to the late 19th century, when the first dedicated bomb squad was formed in London by Sir Vivian Daring Magendi, Chief Inspector of Explosives from 1871 until his death in 1898. Following an incident on October the 2nd, 1874, in which a barge carrying five tons of gunpowder exploded in Regent's Canal, destroying the Macclesfield Bridge and part of London Zoo, Magendi drafted what would become the Explosives Act of 1875, the first modern legislation regulating the safe storage, transport, and disposal of explosives. But his greatest claim to fame would come during the Fenian Dynamite Campaign of 1881 to 1885. The Fenian Brotherhood was an international political organization which fought for Irish independence during the latter half of the 19th century. Following the failed 1867 rebellion in Ireland and the Fenian raids against Canada in 1867, and 1870, the organization changed its tactics and launched a series of bombings against military and civilian targets across the United Kingdom, among the first coordinated terrorism campaigns of its kind in history. The bombings were made possible by two recent technical developments. The first was nitroglycerin and its derivative dynamite, which could be manufactured at home using readily available materials and which for the first time gave revolutionaries access to powerful military-grade explosives. The second was the development of clockwork timers and detonators, a technology pioneer by American Confederate officer John Maxwell. On August the 9th, 1864, Maxwell planted one of his so-called horological torpedoes hidden in a candle box at Union Army headquarters in City Point, Virginia, killing and wounding nearly 300 people. The Fenian campaign began on January the 14th, 1881, with a bombing at an army barracks in Salford, Lancashire, which resulted in the death of a young boy. This was followed by 20 more successful and attempted bombings over the next four years, including a simultaneous attack on the Tower of London, Westminster Crypt, and the House of Commons on January the 24th, 1885, which became known as Dynamite Saturday. In response to the bombings, Sir Vivian Magendi organized a special squad to find and disarm suspected infernal machines. Magendi's personal approach to bomb disposal was very, shall we say, hands-on. 
Following an attack on Victoria Station on February 26, 1884, he found another bomb hidden in the station and disabled its clockwork fuse himself, while his 1898 obituary and the colonist claims, with typical British understatement, it is said of him that he carried an India rubber bag full of nitroglycerin found in the lodgings of a Fenian in a four-wheeled cab to Woolwich, and that on occasion he warned the driver not to collide with any other vehicle on the way, else he might hear no more about it. Yes, despite this seemingly cavalier attitude to the work, Magendi also developed some of the first modern bomb disposal techniques, including specialized tools to allow a technician to manipulate a bomb from a safe distance. For his actions, he was knighted in 1885. Magendi's work during the Fenian bombings would set the template for bomb disposal operations in Northern Ireland nearly a century later. Countries around the world copied the British model, with the New York Police Department forming its own bomb squad in 1903. This unit was created in response to a string of domestic terrorist bombings which had plagued the country since the end of the Civil War, carried out by groups ranging from the Mafia to anarchists to feuding labor unions. Given the shifting nature of the assailants, the NYPD bomb squad went by many names in its early years, including the Italian squad, the anarchist squad, and the radical squad. As most bombs encountered were based on gunpowder or dynamite, the standard disposal technique was to soak any suspicious package in motor oil, thereby neutralizing any explosives within. But the next revolution in bomb disposal would not come until the Second World War, when the German blitz on London and southern England resulted in large numbers of unexploded bombs, or UXBs, in civilian areas which had to be safely disposed of. This led to the Royal Engineers and Royal Army Ordnance Corps to form special bomb disposal companies, which by January 1941 had grown to over 3,700 personnel. While unexploded bombs in the countryside could simply be detonated in place, those in built-up areas required much more sophisticated techniques, such as trepanation, wherein a hole is drilled in the bomb casing and high-temperature steam is used to safely melt or dissolve out the explosives. Other techniques included soaking the fusing mechanism in liquid nitrogen to freeze the batteries or firing mechanisms, and the use of special pullers to stop or extract mechanical time fuses. The latter device was invented by squadron leader Eric Moxley, who had become a legend among wartime bomb disposal technicians. Another legendary figure was Charles Howard, the 20th Earl of Suffolk, who, along with his secretary Eileen Morden and his chauffeur Fred Hards, formed a bomb disposal squad known as the Holy Trinity. Between September 1940 and May 1941, he managed to single-handedly defuse 34 unexploded munitions. Like Sir Vivian Magendi before him, Howard preferred a hands-on approach, as an official report on his work stated, On many occasions, Lord Suffolk cleared everyone away from the danger area and proceeded to operate alone. Deliberately, he exposed himself daily to danger. He was a fatalist, saying, If my name is on a bomb, well, that's it. Seeing every bomb as a unique challenge, Howard's standard procedure was to explore the insides of an open bomb casing with his hands or a stethoscope while Eileen Morden stood nearby recording his observations. But heroic as they were, the exploits of Moxley and Howard were destined to nor later to come to an abrupt end. On August 27, 1940, Eric Moxley was called to dispose of a pair of bombs embedded in the runway at Biggin Hill Aerodrome. While he managed to defuse the first, the second exploded, killing him instantly. Charles Howard's end came less than a year later on May 12, 1941 while defusing his 35th bomb at the Erith Marshes in Kent. The cause of the fatal detonation was a new device which has become the bane of bomb disposal technicians ever since, the anti-handling fuse, a booby trap designed to detonate a bomb and kill anyone who tries to move or disarm it. The development of anti-handling devices and the short life expectancy of early bomb disposal technicians led to the traditional hands-on approach being largely abandoned. Today, in contrast to what is depicted in films like The Hurt Locker, it is exceedingly rare for bomb disposal technicians to interact directly with explosive devices, with most disposal work being carried out from as great a distance as possible using elongated manipulator tools or bomb disposal robots. Many of the specific make-safe procedures used by bomb disposal technicians are closely guarded secrets, as knowledge of these methods would allow bomb makers to build more sophisticated bombs, but the basic principles are relatively simple and well known. The greatest tool in a bomb disposal technician's arsenal is, as with most aspects of life, knowledge, as the best method for disposing of a bomb depends on its particular design and construction. For this reason, many bomb squads are equipped with portable X-ray devices that can be placed beside a suspicious package and used to image its contents. As as happened during the Second World War, bombs found in unbuilt and unpopulated areas are typically detonated in place using a small
small, remotely activated explosive charge. When this is not possible, the bomb squad typically turns to a technique called disruption. At their most basic, all bombs consist of three basic components, the explosive charge, the initiator, and the activating mechanism, which in an electronically actuated bomb typically includes a power source, wires, and a switch. If any of them are removed or deactivated, the bomb will not function, thus the goal of disruption is to separate these three components quickly enough to prevent a firing signal from reaching the explosive charge. This can be accomplished in a variety of ways using devices ranging from an ordinary shotgun to a so-called boot banger, a water-filled shaped explosive charge that projects a supersonic blade of water that can instantly cut a bomb apart. Similar in concept is the pig sticker, a small cannon that fires a high-speed water jet that can punch through steel bomb casings. Many of these techniques were developed in what is regarded as the birthplace of bomb disposal, the 40-year period of conflict in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. From 1969 to 2007, British Army Army Ammunition Technician Officers, or ATOs, played a deadly game of cat and mouse with the Provincial Irish Republican Army, who became increasingly skilled in the design and deployment of improvised explosive devices. The IRA planted bombs in cars, trains, public spaces, and army barracks, making frequent use of anti-handling devices or multiple charges in order to kill army ATOs. On several occasions, militants planted suspicious packages in open areas, exposing the responding ATOs to fire from a concealed sniper. Such tactics led to the deaths of 28 ATOs over the course of the Troubles. Among the most active units in this conflict was the Royal Logistical Corps 321st Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD Company, today the 11th Explosive Ordnance Disposal and Search Regiment, RCL. The 11th is the most decorated peacetime unit in British military history, its members having received more than 200 gallantry awards, most of them for service in Northern Ireland. Perhaps the 11th's greatest contribution to EOD was the development of bomb disposal robots known universally among EOD personnel as wheelbarrows. This device was invented by Lieutenant Colonel Peter Miller of the Royal Tank Regiment following the deaths of eight ATOs during the period of 1971 to 1972. At first, Miller tried to buy and modify a lawnmower, but the store owner suggested an electric wheelbarrow instead and the name stuck. Fitted with manipulator arms and a shotgun or pig stick or water cannon for bomb disruption, the wheelbarrow provided an invaluable tool and is credited with saving hundreds of lives. Today, most bomb squads worldwide employ some form of this technology. In military settings such as Afghanistan and Iraq, disruption or in-place detonation of unexploded munitions is sometimes carried out at long ranges using large-caliber anti-material rifles such as the 50 caliber Barrett M82. Indeed, on at least one occasion in Northern Ireland, sharpshooters were used to carry out a long-range version of the classic Hollywood cut-the-wire maneuver. The IRA had hijacked a train from Dublin to Belfast, disconnected the locomotive, and planted a bomb at either end, the two charges being connected by a long wire. The responding ATOs decided to sever the wire with a rifle bullet so each charge could be dealt with in isolation. The sharpshooter's first two shots missed, but the third struck home, causing the entire train to explode. It was later determined that the wire was not in fact electrical cable, but rather explosive detonating cord. Whoopsie doodle. While disruption is the preferred method for in situ bomb disposal, there are certain cases where this is not possible. For example, many industrial explosives such as dynamite and blasting gelatin are far more shock sensitive than military explosives and can be set off by a shotgun or pig sticker blast. In such cases, it is sometimes necessary to transport the bomb to another location for disposal. This is typically done using a bomb containment chamber, a spherical container designed to contain the blast should the bomb detonate prematurely in transit. Yet Yet despite all the advanced remote technologies available to bomb squads, on rare occasions there is no choice but for a technician to approach the bomb in person in order to x-ray equipment, disruptors, or explosive charges, or to manually disarm a bomb. Among bomb disposal technicians, this is known as the long walk. In order to increase their chances of survival, technicians typically wear heavy protective suits made of thick fire and ballistic resistant Kevlar. This suit is designed to protect the wearer from flying shrapnel and prevent the explosive blast wave from reaching their bodies, but even this is only effective up to a certain point. If the bomb is too powerful or detonates too close to the technician, death via pressure injury to the airway, a condition known as blast lung, is likely. As can be imagined, this kind of work requires a special kind of temperament, as Sergeant First Class Jeffrey McLean of the U.S. 754th Ordnance Company, who participated in nearly 600 EOD calls in Iraq and Afghanistan, explained in a 2011 interview. One thing that helped me relax and clear my mind was knowing everyone was looking to me for answers. I'm the best one that can deal with the problem, and I don't want to let people down. 
I want to get rid of the IED and get that road open again so it doesn't injure soldiers. Occasionally, I hum or sing to myself. My favorites, because of my ethnicity, are Irish drinking songs. They keep me in good spirits when I perform the long walk. Every time I defuse an IED, I look around and mumble to myself and sometimes out loud, nah, you didn't get me, you didn't beat me, who's smarter now? I win. Of what it takes to be a bomb tech, an EOD instructor for the Royal Engineers commented, To some extent, it doesn't seem to matter how we do the technical selection and how many psychometric tests we conduct on the candidates. From my experience, there is only one seemingly infallible way of telling whether someone has what it takes to be a bomb disposal man. Watch them in a bar on the first night. You can always tell the people who will survive through the course and in this business. They are the ones with a very strange sense of humor. Yet whatever their temperament or coping mechanisms, no truly effective bomb tech places themselves at unnecessary risk. In all but the rarest of circumstances, standard procedure is to destroy a bomb as safely as possible from as far away as possible. And as for the classic Hollywood ticking time bomb, another reason this scenario is unrealistic is that most improvised explosive devices encountered today don't use timers at all, being either victim-triggered or remotely detonated by a wire or radio. And in those cases where a timer is used, few bombers are courteous enough to display the time remaining in giant red numbers. So should you ever come across a bomb, put away the wire cutters, back away, and leave the disarming to the experts, or you may very well find yourself traveling rapidly in every direction at once. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor, Magic Spoon, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.